Good morning, uh, brethren and friends. Uh, welcome to the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, I want to talk with you today a little bit about doubt. Does our unbelief bring turmoil? Do you ever doubt? What is doubt? And why do we do it? And how does it affect our lives and our faith? And how can we alleviate this doubt that arises in us? Well, let's start with what is doubt? Uh, Merriam Dictionary defines doubt as to be uncertain about s something or to believe that something may not be true or is unlikely. Doubt can also be considered a, a lack of faith. I believe that doubt is one of Satan's many tools that he uses to draw us away from our Heavenly Father. I reckon most of us, if not all of us, have had our doubts. But why? Why is it that we doubt, other than our adversary planting his seeds within our minds? Have certain things caused you to doubt? Doubt God or your faith? Did someone you know and trust ever forsake you? Or maybe some other circumstance has caused you to doubt or has weakened your faith? Because that's what doubt does. It weakens our faith. And if left unattended, it can destroy one's faith. That's how doubt affects our lives. And when we allow it to enter our hearts and our minds, it pushes out our faith, our hope, joy and peace and replaces all that with those things with worry, fear, and confusion, which all comes from our adversary, Satan. Satan plays on doubts that occur in our minds, whether he placed them there or not. Satan started planting those doubting seeds in the garden with Adam and Eve. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Genesis 3, and we'll read verses 1 through 6. Genesis 3, verse 1 says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he, Satan, said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. There are others who doubted God as well, besides just Adam and Eve. Uh, if you're still in Genesis, you can turn over to chapter 18. In chapter 18, here we have Abraham. He was out in front of his tent, and we saw the Lord coming, and ran out to meet him, and offered to feed him, and have them rest there. So in Genesis 18:9, it says, Then they said to him, Abraham, where is, your, where is Sarah, your wife? So he said, here, in the tent. And he said, Jesus being, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life, and behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Sarah was listening in the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age. And Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Verse 12 says, Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I surely bear a child since I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh. For she was afraid and he said no but you did laugh so we see here that Sarah also doubted with insiders 
Even uh, John the Baptist, after calling Jesus the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world in John 1, had his moment of doubt while in prison. And there you read it in Matthew 11. Not only John, but the apostles as well. Peter doubted when he was called out onto the water. Thomas doubted after the resurrection of Jesus. In Matthew 28, 16, it reads, Then the eleven disciples went away to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. The same has happened to us, and that is why we are told in God's word on numerous occasions not to doubt. Uh, a few examples are Matthew 21, 21, Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you that if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to this fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. In 1 Timothy 2, verse 8, it says, I desire therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Another one in James 1, 6 says, But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. I mentioned earlier that doubt could be considered a lack of faith. And why is it that people lack faith? Well, here's something from the late Pastor General of the Old Worldwide Church of God, Herbert W. Armstrong, that he wrote in his booklet entitled, What is Faith? And in it he writes, And now briefly, why don't we have faith? And how may we get it? And how may it be increased? So many say, well, I have no impression. I have no feeling, no conviction that I shall get the answer. They want to wait until they get a certain conviction, a certain feeling, a sort of assurance they can feel. But before they really believe, they shall have the answer. But that is not faith. That is feeling. Your feeling, your convictions, your impressions have absolutely not one thing to do or the other to do with your faith. Faith has only to do with God's Word. The question is, has God promised it in the Bible? If He has, then probabilities, possibilities, feelings, convictions, impressions have nothing whatsoever to do with it. God has a thousand ways we know nothing of, of answering and providing what He has promised. We don't need to see how He's going to do it. And that's another thing. He almost never will do it the way we expect. He continues, So don't try to figure out how it is possible for God to do it. You're trusting in a supernatural power. Then believe in that power. God works in mysterious ways in His wonders to perform. What He has promised, He will perform. But He will do it His way and in His time. Leave all that to Him. And just trust Him and re rely upon His Word. That was uh, from Herbert Armstrong. And yes, we are told not to doubt. But where do we start? In an issue of the Worldwide News, June 13, 1983, there was an article by Dexter H. Faulkner entitled, Faith and Honest Doubt. And in that article, Faulkner listed four principles to help us escape the stronghold of doubt. The first principle is we must honestly admit our doubts. If we ever hope to deal with doubt, we must be willing to honestly admit that we don't believe. The second principle is we are biblically commanded to fellowship with other believers. Fellowship with other believers strengthens our faith. Isolation from the Sabbath and the holy days and Bible study breeds and nourishes doubt. The longer we remain in isolation, the greater our doubt becomes. Third principle is we need to daily remember God's promises. Many doubts arise because we have forgotten or haven't understood God's promises about our problems. And you can find some of God's promises in Matthew 6, verses 24 through 34. And most importantly, we need to bring our doubts directly to God through prayer and remembrance of when and how 
we were each called out of darkness. So we openly admit our doubts. Then we begin to increase our faith. I've found that giving God glory when He answers your prayers and when He enlightens you through study and meditation, it helps to increase your faith. You know, those aha moments that you come to when the little light bulb comes on, that's not chance. That's the Holy Spirit. And when you recognize that and give that credit where it's due, your faith will increase and continue to remove doubt that was in your minds. As the doubt leaves you and your faith increases, you'll find that there's more room, so to speak, for the fruits of the Spirit. The ones we know as love, hope, forgiveness, and even confidence, just to name a few. In his book, Faith for Those God Has Called and Chosen, Dr. Teal talks increasingly about faith. Increasing faith takes a lifetime. Sometimes it seems quite difficult. There are so many aspects of it, they cannot be covered in a short paper. But from the Bible, we see that those called of God had faith and lived by faith. We see that faith is the substance of things hoped for. We see that faith came by the hearing of the Word of God from the preachers that God sent. And we see that the faithful searched the Scriptures to be sure that the preachers were of God. We see that uh, we see that we are to have faith of Jesus. We also learn that the faithful were obedient, and that they did not forsake the assembly of themselves together. That they exhorted one another, and that they prayed, and that they fasted. Faith is a gift of God, as it says in Ephesians two eight, and an important aspect of the law. The just are to live by faith. You can read the, about that in Habakkuk 2.4, Romans 1.17, and Galatians 3. God promises to reward those who have the courage to exercise faith and to overcome their fears, but not to those who do not. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable murderers, sexually immoral, Sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And that's Revelation 21, verses 7 through 8. The Bible shows that the faithful have demonstrated their faith by keeping the commandments and otherwise doing what God wanted them to do while living in, in an ungodly world. By believing God and living as He instructs, your faith can be increased. So please strive to be one that really has faith when Jesus returns. And do not doubt. This is Chad Brenton with the Continuing Church of God.